Welcome to AMM 2450, and this is our third lecture on cultural perspective on consumerism. So for this lecture, we're going to be talking about culture, consumer culture, and kind of how we're viewing it. So how we understand it, it's the accumulation of shared meanings, rituals, norms, traditions, passed among, you know, the members of a particular society. So keywords here, they're passed down from generation to generation. It's distinctive, It's so it's not the same everywhere. Um, it varies from uh, geographic area to geographic area. It's a learned mode of living. It does deal with interactions among its citizens, among people, and the environment. It's physical and non-physical. Um, it's st it's not static. It, it definitely changes. Um, so it's not a static thing. There's changes. It doesn't stay the same. It evolves. So in class, I'll be showing you a quick little video. And it discusses a lot on a very, not a lot actually, but uh, various cultures, kind of just the general kind of overview of a, of a culture, like here in the U.S. or um, Spanish-speaking cultures. Uh, we are lucky. We do live in a very diverse um, area where we do, here in Southern California, where we do see um, people from a lot of different backgrounds. So we do see a mixture of people from various cultures and how we interact is very important. So uh, we'll be discussing in class. Um, I'll be asking you for you to actually describe like if the U.S. I want you to think about U.S. culture. So I want you to think about it between now and class. If you if the U.S. was a person, how would you describe its personality traits? You know, and how would you compare it to other parts of the world? And I understand it's going to depend if you travel a lot or you don't and how well versed you are in other, you know, culture in other areas. But think about it. Would you consider it materialistic or selfless or positive or negative? Or how would you describe it? If it was, if you describe a person, you know, oh, she's cheerful or he's nice or this person's very positive and nice and fun to be with, um, you know, very driven, um, you know, you would describe them like that. So how would you describe the U.S. if it was a person? What personality traits would you give it? So I'll be asking you to think about that and give those. So when it comes to culture, we, I stress material versus non-material, and you have to know the difference, and I'm sure you do, but just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, we look at both, okay, because actually studying material items also help us understand how people lived in the past and how it helps us understand how people live now and it'll help us understand how people are going to live in the future. So we look at things like what you wear on your body, clothing, and that includes like accessories like jewelry, footwear, all that stuff, uh, computers, cell phones, cars, TVs, furniture, electronics, um, items that you use for hobbies and sports, those kind of things. Um, so we look at material things, things that are tangible, you can touch them, you can see them. And also non-material, so the language, religious beliefs, or lack thereof, um, rituals, standards, expectations, symbolic meanings. All these are things that we look at in the non-material. You can't touch them, um, but they're there, and they have an impact on the culture. Okay, so we're going to look at um, material and non-material. So, what is Western culture typically known for? It's known for like the good life. Low, we typically have low cost consumer textile and technological driven products. We are a demand variety. We demand variety, um, speed and convenience. Um, we want all different choices when it comes to food and clothes. We want different colors. And apparently what we see is not enough. So we'll go online and get a custom color. Uh, we want speed. I mean, now we go through a drive through and we spit out a number. We don't even have to say, like, I want the cheeseburger value meal. We go, I just want the number one. One. Medium, small, medium, or large. I mean, that's, we spit out a number. I mean, what's next? We blink and they know our order. It's, we want convenience. And if you wait for five minutes in the drive through we get so angry and upset and people get really exasperated. I still think you have to stop and think about it for a second. I mean, you pull up to a box, you say, I want a number one, size small, and within five minutes, you get a meal. We, we're talking a drink, the side, and the main meal. You get a full meal in less than five minutes, and you don't even get out of your car. Um, and yet, we still complain about it. So, I, I still think that's amazing if you think about it. If you sit down and think about it, it's pretty amazing. But lots of choices. The question is, at what cost? And what are these demands that are pushed on us or are we doing the demanding? Are, are the demands being pushed on us? Oh, you're making us 
uh, have to pick from all these things? Or are we putting, are we doing the demanding? We're really good at criticizing others. We're not good at looking inward. So that's something that I, that I ask you to think about for a second. Our supermarkets have so much variety. And think about it. At any time, I can go in December and buy some strawberries. Strawberries are not in season until the summer. And yet I can go all through the year and there'll always be strawberries. There's other parts in the world where you can only buy the fruit when it's in season. It's what they grow. They don't import it in. It would be too expensive. You can afford it. So the fact that I can get strawberries, watermelon, grapes, apples at any time, regardless of if whether it's in season or not, that's pretty amazing. We have tons of choices. Um... Other parts, you know, you go to food markets in other parts of the world, they, it's what you see is what you get. Okay, what you see is what you get. You can't go, well, let me go in the back and see what I have. This is it. This is what you have. Um, and you don't have uh, the plethora of chases. This is Brazil. And, of course, they do have the bigger supermarkets, but a lot of these markets are small, believe it or not. You know, they're tiny. Uh, Venezuela, some of them not doing so hot uh, right now. They're, they're, they're struggling. So... Yeah, we other places don't have the variety that we're used to and accustomed, uh, accustomed to having. So we hear a lot of consumer behavior and culture. Uh, culture does help us determine our overall priorities as a consumer and how much it, uh, value we attach and, and importance we attach to activities and products. It does mandate the success of products because if they don't offer products that kind of fit in with our culture, we will, we will reject it, right? I would say like, we're not helpless consumers. I will tell you that. I'm, I'm not here to tell you what to think, but I'm going to tell you right now. We're not helpless consumers. Okay. We communicate with our dollars, with our money. If we don't like it and we don't buy it, then it doesn't get purchased. They won't make it. Um, if we keep buying it and we demand more, they'll, they'll make more. So we speak volumes with our purchase decisions. So an example that I'll give you, if our current culture emphasizes individuality, then having choices that can be customized to what you want, that does well. If you go to a coffee place and they just give you like regular decaf and that's it, that coffee shop isn't going to do well, right? They're not because they're not giving you choices. People like that, you know, soy milk or almond milk, um, latte versus, you know, cappuccino, a frappuccino, an espresso drink, uh, this drink. Uh, you know, with half milk, half something frothed and added to it. I don't know. An extra shot, double shot, triple shot, quad shot. I don't know. It keeps going. Um, so obviously, though, if it's an individual, then anything that's customized, something more individualized, that tends to do well. So a couple of things, uh, areas that we look in culture, we look at ecology, social structure, and ideology. So we look at how a uh, way in which a system is adapted to its habitat. So we look at our surroundings. So it's funny. We do tend to look at the Japanese um, culture when it comes to ecology because they're very efficient, space efficient, um, and they're very minimalist. So that's an area, a place where I, I think especially lately we tend to look at. Um, social structure and the which way so or orderly social life is maintained. Uh, we tend to look at what doesn't go right. So that's what you tend to see in the news. So globally, you can tend to look at where there are places where there's chaos. And then when we look at what's working, we'll look at like, I don't know, people tend to look at Sweden or Finland. Um, but we do look at two others again in, in comparison to see, you know, order um, and, you know, making sure that its inhabitants are getting along. And ideology, you know, well, how we think, you know, mental characteristics, the way people relate to the environment and social groups, you know, how you interpret things. Because that's going to, uh, you know, it's really going to dictate how you interpret things and how you react, whether you react positively to an idea or negatively. There is a lot of negative reactions out there. So it does matter. Um, I'm so sorry. I I don't know why it's doing that on this computer. Um, but one thing that we do look is how we learn culture. And we we do see a lot of socialization and culturation and uh, acculturation. So uh, socialization is the process in which persons learn and internalize rules and they see patterns in a, in a society. So it's social so socialization. You basically, you learn and you learn through various ways. But the idea is that they're giving you information and you basically learn it, you adapt to it, you copy it, um, you're told this is what we do, this is what we don't do. Now, enculturation is the process by which you learn and adopt the norms and values of, of the culture. Okay, And then acculturation is when assimilating. 
to norms and values from other cultures. So the idea is taking a combination of other cultures and really adopting the norms and really exemplifying that you know your um, culture. So you learn from it, um, you learn rules, then you learn your culture and how those rules apply to that, and then you can learn from new cultures. So it's you learn in various ways. Now the non-material culture, we're talking about symbols, values, and norms. So these things you can't see uh, necessarily like norms are unwritten rules. So it's not a law, but it's what, what's acceptable and unacceptable. So how to greet someone. It's acceptable to extend your hand and shake their hand. If someone extends their hand and you don't shake it, that's considered rude. There's no law. You're not breaking a law, but you're being really rude. Um, values are judgments of what's important and meaningful. Um, so what what matters to you? Those are your values. And symbols, they communicate ideas and they can be in, in uh, distinct in and of itself. So like this is perfect, the peace sign, right? So when someone does this gesture with their hand, you know they're saying peace, you know? Um, the thing itself is it's a hand, it's their fingers. Um, they're giving you a symbolic gesture with their hands. There's other gestures that are not so friendly uh, that you can also do with your fingers. Um, this one's a friendly one, peace. You know, you know, they mean you no harm. Um, but there are other gestures that aren't quite, quite so nice. Uh, in terms of norms, uh, there's different types. So please read up on these, but there's enacted. Some are explicit rules, like you stop at a red, red light, you stop at a red, you know, stop sign. Uh, some are very explicit, some are written out. Um, Crescive norms are learned and writ uh, practiced by members of a particular, you know, social unit, but not necessarily recognized by non-members. So it's very subtle, it's, it's embedded. Um, so there's like conventions, customs, mora, you know, mores. Um, so the idea is that, you know, there's certain things in certain communities that you understand. Um, and it's practiced by, you know, others, but not those that aren't members. So, um, so they're very subtle. Um, but if you're a member of that particular group, you know it. If you're not, you may not be aware of it. Uh, conventions are regarding just like everyday life. You know, again, greeting people. Customs, things that you hand out from your previous generation, you know, they, they get passed down from generation to generation. These tend to be very slow to change. And mores, which is a custom with a very strong moral overtone. So the idea is that if you go to a, you know, a funeral, you don't dress in a super tight, you know, mini skirt and a flashing sequined top. You know, you, you wear black. Um, and the idea is that, you know, you're paying respect. And if you don't do that, you're, you're, you're kind of lacking respect. Um, and I'll show a video in class, but um, things that, an example, it's the scene from The Office, but, you know, that things were like kind of out of what you consider the realm of normal. Not breaking the law or anything like that, but it's just, you know, what's considered standard and normal and what's not. In an office, for example. So, you can't break the standards to stand out. It can turn, though, into something ordinary later. Uh, tattoos are a perfect example. Very few people had tattoos way back when you were either like in prison or you were in the military or you were just a rebel. You were just like someone dangerous and scary. Now everyone has like a million tattoos on their body. It's, you know, it's not, it's, it's ordinary. Everyone has one now practically. Now you stand out if you don't have one instead of standing up because you do have one. So, um, that's a perfect example of how things can are used to break out of the standard and then it turned into like every day. Um, Lady Gaga's Meat Dress, if you didn't remember that one, the video, MTV Music Video Awards, back when I think they had some videos. I don't know. They don't do music anymore, I don't think. Just reality shows, really bad reality shows. Um, but she did the Meat Dress. You, that's not standard. You wouldn't think to, you know, that's just not typical. She did it so people can talk about it. She, was the talk of the town and again this is not conventional you know she didn't break a law she probably made vegetarians very angry but um she didn't break a law um things to know um uh, words to know sorry that got cut off but subculture just know um counterculture and mainstream most of you do know these words but in case you don't subculture is a cultural group within a larger uh group larger culture um and you do sh share uh, you have an affiliate, you're affiliated with, you have shared beliefs, preferences, practices. Counterculture is you're basically going against the grain. It's direct conflict. Your behavior goes totally against the mainstream. And you're just like, you're just, you know, considered rebellious in that sense. So hippies from the mid sixties is a perfect example. They were supporting civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, 
they were rejecting the Vietnam War. They were totally like different. They weren't about working. Um, they were more like, you know, a lot on the peace and love, also a lot on the drugs. Um, considered counterculture mainstream, general ma majority, larger population, and mass acceptance. Just careful because sometimes some things, again, that start as counterculture end up as the mainstream. I do see those changes now uh, very quickly. Um, like right now, the current idea is that I say life is make life one big beer commercial. I'll show you in class. But the idea is that, you know, you don't see people working. It's that I want to have fun. And, and now I have an Instagram worthy post and I'll show you my drink. And I, I'm saying it's like we're pushing on social media that life is one giant, you know, beer commercial. So a couple of things that we need to know uh, in terms of cultural um, hostides, cultural dimensions. Um, this is by a psychologist, and it's it's a theory, you know, um, that was really used uh, in psychology, sociology, marketing, and management studies. And that's a, there's a, four original dimensions and two dimensions that were added to it. So the power di distance index, individualism versus collectivism, masculinity versus femininity, uncertainty avoidance index, long-term orientation versus short-term, and indulgence versus restraint. So in the part two of this lecture, we'll go over um, Hofstede's uh, cultural dimensions and talk a little bit about um, how that applies to um, what we're going to be discussing for the rest of the semester. Thanks for listening, and please make sure you watch part two of this lecture.